Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. You are listening to What on Earth is Happening right here on the Revolution Broadcasting Internet Radio Network. I'm your host, Mark Passio. This show is live every Tuesday evening from 7 to 9 p.m. Eastern Time. My website is whatonearthishappening.com. The network's website, revolutionbroadcasting.com. We have a packed show for you here this evening. So, I'm going to jump right into the event announcements, and after that, we'll go into the contest. Uh, it's the first contest that we're doing uh, live on What on Earth is Happening, and uh, we will get into that this evening. So, the event announcements, I read event announcements for the Philadelphia area. It's all about activism, folks. This show is about freedom. And ultimately, to be free, we have to take right action in the world. And therefore, I want to read um, a couple of uh, event announcements for events that are coming up in the Philadelphia area. If you live in the area, try to make it out to some of these. The Global Dialogue Institute of Haverford College presents the Global Philosophy Forum. Consciousness, Connectivity, and Integral Modes of Reality, a Deep Dialogue on Science and Philosophy in Quest of the Unified Field of Reality. So this is going to be taking place at Haverford College at Marshall Auditorium, Saturday, October 23rd, 2010, from 1 to 6 p.m. And the keynote speaker is Dr. Bruce H. Lipton, Bruce Lipton, the author of The Biology of Belief, Unleashing the Power of Consciousness, Matter, and Miracles, and Spontaneous Evolution, Our Positive Future. His talk will be called Spontaneous Evolution, Our Positive Future, and a way to get there from here. Bruce Lipton, critical information. Uh, I highly recommend people check this out. Um, the other keynote speaker is Barbara Marks Hubbard, visionary futurist and co-founder of the Foundation for Conscious Evolution. Her talk is going to be called Conscious Evolution, Visions of a Universal Humanity. This forum is presented by Ashok Gangadian. He is going to be giving a talk called Awakening Global Enlightenment, Our Great Evolutionary Shift. The entire theme for this uh, philosophy forum is called Making Sense of Our Great Evolutionary Shift. So that's at Haverford College, Marshall Auditorium, Saturday, October 23rd, 1 to 6 p.m. A $10 donation at the door is appreciated but not absolutely necessary. So, the second an announcement I have is the Mind Body Spirit Expo that's coming up at the Valley Forge Convention Center just outside of Philadelphia. This is going throughout the weekend, October 22nd to 24th. I mention this because the keynote speaker is a man who really helped me out a lot in my journey in consciousness, and that's Neil Donald Walsh. He is going to be the keynote speaker at Mind Body Spirit Expo, October 22nd through 24th at the Valley Forge Convention Center. For more information, check out mindbodyspiritexpo.com. Neil Donald Walsh, uh, author of Conversations with God. And Another event announcement I have is for a UFO-related conference that I have been asked to speak at, and I've accepted. Uh, it's kind of a last-minute thing, but that's fine. This is called the UFO ET Congress 2010. This will be taking place in Bordentown, New Jersey, at the Ramada Inn, November 13th and 14th. The Ramada Inn is at 1083, that's 1083 U.S. Highway 206 in Bordentown, New Jersey. The topic that I'm going to be speaking on is disclosure. And my presentation is called Don't Count on Disclosure. And it is about the deepest reasons for the worldwide cover-up of the 
UFO and extraterrestrial phenomena. The other speakers are Dennis Roger Den Denokla from Paris. He is going to be giving a talk called UFOs Crop Circles and 18 Visiting Exo Civilizations. Jacqueline de Libes will be talking on extraterrestrial forces of the light. Dr. Julian Salt from Great Britain will be giving a talk called UFOs, ETs, and the New World Situation. Dan Smith giving a talk called Selling the Best Possible World and Its Best Possible Ending. And the Master of Ceremonies for this conference is Pat J. Marcatilio. And Pat is the Master of Ceremonies and he's hosting the conference. And you can check out more information at his site, which is drufo.org, drufo.org. So I'm honored to be part of that conference. And the next two event announcements go together. I'm hosting a conference called Free Your Mind, a conference on consciousness, mind control, and the occult. This will be taking place in Philadelphia in April of 2011. Free Your Mind is a unique two-day conference scheduled for April 9th and 10th, 2011, in Philadelphia, PA, featuring multiple speakers and diverse educational materials for the purpose of raising public awareness of the critically important topics of mass mind control techniques, the covert and subversive influences upon our consciousness and behavior, trauma-based and ritualized abuse, and the practical mental and emotional healing technologies available for those affected by these devices. The date is Saturday, April 9th, and Sunday, April 10th, 2011. The time, 10 a.m. to 8 p.m., both days. The doors will be opening at 9 a.m., both days. The location is Ruba Hall, Ruba Hall, R-U-B-A Hall, at 414 Green Street in Philadelphia. Admission price is very reasonable at only $20 per day. The confirmed speakers, and we have two new confirmed speakers for the Free Your Mind conference this week. Just added. The confirmed speakers so far, Aaron McCollum, Alfred Weber, Andrew Bastiago. Just added, Mr. Bob Tuscan, the owner of the Revolution Broadcasting Radio Network. He'll be giving a talk about how scarcity affects human consciousness versus what consciousness might become were we to live in an abundance based an abundance based society. Very critically important topic and Bob Tuscan will be talking on that at the Free Your Mind conference. Farah Yurdozu, another speaker, again just added this week, Jan Irvin of Gnostic Media. He will be uh, talking about psychedelics and the Trivium Method of Education. Also speaking, Jay Parker, John Nicholson, Larkin Rose, Laura Magdalene Eisenhower, myself, Mark Passio, Mel Fabregas, Michael Kelly, and Suzanne Taylor. That's the Free Your Mind Conference, a, con a conference on consciousness, mind control, and the occult, April 9th and 10th, Philadelphia. For more information, visit freeyourmindconference.com. Connected with this, we are doing a fundraiser for the Free Your Mind Conference, Friday, November 5th, 2010, at 8 o'clock p.m. in Philadelphia at Liberty's Pub on the second floor of the pub. Liberties is at 705 North 2nd Street. That's at 2nd and Fairmount in Philadelphia. A $10 donation at the door is requested to support the effort to bring some of the out-of-town speakers uh, in for the Free Your Mind Conference. 
We will be having live music at this fundraiser. Mr. Chip Raymond will be doing a couple of acoustic sets, and we'll have a 50-50 raffle. All proceeds will go to offsetting the cost to bring in out-of-town speakers for the conference in April. Tickets for the Free Your Mind conference go on sale Friday, November 5th, the 5th of November. The tickets for the conference will be available at the conference fundraiser at Liberty's on November 5th. For more info on the conference and the fundraiser, please visit www.freeyourmindconference.com. So, it looks to me as if we are having some problems broadcasting over TalkShoe. Um, I am going to unblock the chat on the um, on the uh, TalkShoe live program. Could someone from the forum, if they're listening through Revolution Broadcasting, confirm that? Um, I am not coming in through TalkShoe through my site. It looks like there's another problem with TalkShoe. I started the show through them, and it immediately disconnected me for some reason. So it looks like we're broadcasting fine over Revolution Broadcasting, but it looks like we've dropped out of TalkShoe. If anyone can confirm that, uh, either through Skype or through the TalkShoe Live pro program for me, please do so. Uh, that's going to make it difficult to have this... Um, to have this uh, contest go over uh, the airwaves. So what I'll probably do is just uh, work it through email, and we will um, determine a winner that way. The first email that comes in um, will be the winner, because I don't believe I'm going to take, be able to take calls uh, on the show because the the show has already somehow prematurely terminated the talk show. So I apologize for the technical difficulties. Uh, that's okay because I have a local backup recording uh, right here locally on my computer. So the podcast will still make it up there and we're still going out live over Revolution Broadcasting. So um, let's get into the contest. Uh, this was brought up because last week the topic of alchemy came up on the show. And what I wanted to do was to inspire some people to look into the science of alchemy, into the occult science of alchemy, because it can be an incredible journey in consciousness once you understand what alchemy really is. I believe it was Bob from Cincinnati who called in last week and brought up alchemy, and I decided to do a little contest and the winner of the contest would receive a free weekend pass to the Free Your Mind Conference. So I have a couple of just, you know, general small ground rules that I want to ask people to uh, observe for this contest. If you don't really want to attend the conference, please don't respond to the question, to the, to the riddle that is going to go out over the airwaves and has been on my site for about a week. Uh, please, reserve this for people that do really want to attend the conference and can attend it, okay? So if you're, you know, from the West Coast and you know you're not going to be, make, be able to make it out to Philadelphia, don't bother to uh, respond to this just to prove that you know the answer. Please uh, reserve this for people who do want to attend the conference and can attend it, can make it there in April, know that they're going to be able to attend it. Okay, that's the only thing I ask. So, I'm going to give the, I'm going to read the riddle out over the airwaves, and the first person to email the following email address will be the winner of a weekend pass, that's two free tickets, one for each day, for one individual, to the Free Your Mind Conference in April of 2011. Here we go. Uh, I'm being told that uh, TalkShoe is responding, that the voice is going out over TalkShoe. I don't know if I'll be able to take calls, so we can try to do that, but if that doesn't work, we'll go out over, uh, we'll, we'll take the answers by email. Um, 
We'll give you a call-in number in case people are able to call in. The call-in number for the show is 724-444-7444. Once again, the call-in number, 724-444-7444. The call ID number is 83515. You have to put that in after you call the call-in number so that it identifies and routes you through to what on earth is happening. Once again, the call ID number for what on earth is happening, 83515. So, this is the riddle, and I'll give the email address, okay? Let's say if the calls come in, we'll take that. If whoever's the first caller, they can, they can claim the prize if they have the correct answer. Um, if calls aren't working through TalkShoe, um, we will uh, uh, go to email as an alternative. So here is the riddle. This is a document called Better Living Through Alchemy. The key to life and death is everywhere to be found. But if you do not find it in your own house, you will find it nowhere. Yet, it is before everyone's eyes. No one can live without it. Everyone has used it. The poor usually possess it more than the rich. Children play with it in the streets. The meek and uneducated esteem it highly. But the privileged and learned often throw it away. It is the only thing from which the philosopher's stone can be prepared, and without it, no noble metal can be created. People who blindly follow socially accepted values, beliefs, and behavior are no longer connected to the mystery of this thing, and therefore throw it away. Medieval alchemists frequently referred to this thing as the cornerstone the builders forgot. In other words, it is something important that is not an integrated part of our current civilization. Sometimes these intimations are only obvious at quiet times or when we focus our undivided attention on the present moment or enter deep medita meditation seeking to learn the true nature of reality. To alchemists, consciousness is a force of nature that can be harnessed and purified through prayer and meditation, and then added to the experiment, just like a chemical ingredient. Magic has the power to experience and fathom things which are inaccessible to human reason. For magic is a great secret wisdom, just as reason is a great public folly. Within every living thing, there exists a hidden star that is that thing's quintessence. One of the symbols for the quintessence is the star. In general terms, the star is the truest part of anything, the divine thought that gives things their form and being. Too much reliance on intellect instead of intuition will surely spell disaster for the world. We have assimilated the sun's masculine spirit on earth, and it has led to great technological advances. But our lunar, feminine soul has been pushed away in the process. The key to transformation is the union of solar and lunar forces, the sacred marriage of the sun and the moon. Instead, there exists an estrangement between them, and correspondingly, between our own spirits and souls. Our intuition lies in our innocence. Your head must bow to your heart. This is called Better Living Through Alchemy, and the author is anonymous. However, I would make the claim that they are also enlightened. And the question, the question here is, what is 
the key to life and death that is referred to in the first paragraph. This entire thing is actually a riddle. It is trying to get you to understand what is that thing from which the philosopher's stone, the lapis philosophorum, can be prepared. That thing that without it, no noble metal can be created. It is called in this document the key to life and death in the first paragraph. And I want to know what that is. What is the key to life and death that is being spoken of? This document is on my website. You can look at it in the news section. Um, it is the first recent news item. So here's what to do. Call in the call-in number. And if you have the correct answer for this, two free tickets, a weekend pass, both days, one ticket for Saturday, one ticket for Sunday, for one person to the Free Your Mind Conference in April of 2011 in Philadelphia. In the event that callers cannot call the call-in number, email, send an email to this address, whatonearth93, that's whatonearth93, at gmail.com, whatonearth93, at gmail.com. I'll say that one more time. The first person to send an email with the correct answer to this alchemical riddle to what on earth 93, the number 93, at gmail.com will receive two free tickets to the Free Your Mind Conference in April. I'll be checking that periodically as the show unfolds. So that is the contest, and hopefully we'll have a winner before the end of the show. If we don't, it will go to... Uh, next week. So, the topic for this evening of the show is going to be food and medicine. Specifically, food and medicine as a technique for mass control. We have been analyzing and discussing over the past many weeks the methodologies of mind control. And we've been emphasizing how important it is to look at this dark topic. People may be uncomfortable with this. They may not want to believe that this is going on. But the fact of the matter remains that this is what is taking place. And it is critically important if we are to emerge from mind control, which the vast majority of the human species is under in one form or another, if we are to break these mental chains and emerge from this state of consciousness, this dark state of consciousness, which we are artificially being held in through what we get to see and hear through the mainstream media, read about in newspapers and magazines, etc. Connected fundamentally with this is what we put into our bodies that nourishes us or doesn't nourish us, as the case may be. The adage that we are what we eat is true. But as we talked about on the show last week, it's more than that. We are what we put into our body in totality, meaning not only what we eat and drink and take in in the way of medications or drugs, etc. We are what we take into our eyes and ears, what we listen to, what we pay attention to, what we watch, what we hear. So we have to become discerning not only about the sources of information that we pay attention to, but also what we physically put into our body. Because what we put into our body is ultimately information. We are comprised of information. Everything is comprised of information. 
And if we put junk in, we will get junk out. It's a very simple equation. Junk goes in, junk comes out. Good stuff goes in, good stuff comes out. The truth is simple. It is very simple to understand. It's not as complex as some people want to make it. Dominators and controllers want you to think in terms of impossible complexity. It cannot be perceived or conceived. Therefore, people won't even begin trying to seek truth. But the fact of the matter is, truth is always simple. So we're going to talk about today problems with our food. We're going to look at the dark side of this. We're going to uncover things that are going on with our food that fundamentally hold us back as a species, that pave the way toward more control, that pave the way toward more ignorance, that pave the way toward more apathy in our society. And food has the power to do that. I should say we have the power to let that happen or to stop it from happening and make a change for the better based on what we choose to put into our body. And this is one that most people have a relative modicum of control over in their own lives. Thus far, they still do. Now, if we're not careful, that could change for the worse. It's what we get to choose that we eat and drink. You know, another component of this is the air we breathe. We have not that much control over that, uh, being how we pollute the air through industry, through uh, transportation forms that we use, and through the chemtrail phenomenon, which if anybody listening has not researched, I would highly suggest that you do so and look at the types of toxic um, particles that they're spraying into our atmosphere. So that's something we don't have too much control over, but I'll touch on it, um, perhaps not in this uh, show today, but in a future show. We're going to spend a couple of weeks on this topic, and we're going to take our time unfolding it because this is a critically important topic of research and is critical to understand if we're going to understand how we build ourselves into better human beings and how we do that by making higher consciousness choices about what we take into ourselves. And we can only do that once we understand that essentially everything is made of information, including us, including that which we take into our mind that which we, and that which we take into our body through our food. The first doctor of modern civilization, Hippocrates, this is the um, Greek historical figure from which the Hippocratic, Hippocratic Oath, which doctors still take to do no harm, is named. It is named after Hippocrates. He said, let thy food be thy medicine, and thy medicine be thy food. So he had a profoundly deep understanding of what actually generates health and well-being. Sadly, in the modern age, most people, not all, but most people of our species have gone wildly off the track about what generates health. And we have to get back to these simple fundamental principles as espoused by someone like Hippocrates that what we need to generate our health, to be our medicine, to be our guide to good health, is simply the foods that we choose to eat or correspondingly not eat. And a huge profound level of ignorance abounds in our society about what good food is. A huge level of ignorance abounds about what 
levels of toxins we can safely take into ourselves and not affect our minds and our judgment and our consciousness in general. And that needs to change. The only way that's going to change if we understand what has been done to our food supply that we take in on a daily basis. And I'll tell you what, a lot of, a big portion of the freedom movement is not onto this information. I see a lot of people not eating very healthily in, in the freedom movement. There are people who have partial pictures of the whole dynamic that's taking place. And, you know, I harp on this here. It's something I'm not quiet about. I think it's a, a dangerous thing and it's not a good thing to have a partial picture. I think more people need to research a whole lot more and go a whole lot deeper. You know, people in the freedom movement, you know, have a very partial picture of a lot of things, a lot of things, not just about food. You know, I, I talk to activists in the freedom movement and they don't want to acknowledge that the occult is something that is real. And they're kidding themselves. They're absolutely kidding themselves. But they have an attachment to certain belief systems. And, you know, you, you bring up food to some people and they have attachments. They, they, you know, want to continue to eat what they've always eaten and think that that has no bearing on consciousness. And it does. It most certainly does. And we'll talk about why food has bearing on that. And this is totally connected with the structure of the brain, which we talked about on this show numerous times in past shows. When we don't have quality nutrients entering our body and our, our, our whole mind-body system in general, we significantly imbalance the brain, specifically the neocortex of the brain. This is the part of the brain that really needs proper nutrition to function properly as the executive command center of the human brain. The higher rational thought processes, the higher mind functions. We we'll talk about the components of the neocortex, the left and right brain and their brain functions. And we also talked about in previous shows what happens when the neocortex becomes dysfunctional when it becomes imbalanced toward one brain hemisphere or the other, what results? You can go back on past podcasts and listen to that. But essentially, destabilization of the neocortex means that our behavior is going to be fundamentally changed for the worse as a result of this destabilization of the higher thought functions of the brain. We will revert into reptile mode, reptilian brain, the R complex, which is base consciousness, survival, me, me, me thinking, okay? Pure egoic selfishness, hoarding, not caring about your fellow human beings, acting like a psychopath. Considering personal survival the only thing that's of any importance, screw everybody else. Complete ego identification. Complete identification with the physical and the material. No thought of morals and higher awareness or consciousness. You know, that's, that's mostly due to left brain imbalance, that type of behavior and dysfunction. Right brain imbalance does the opposite, but just as much damage. And that will create a slave-like mentality. Go along to get along. Don't challenge. Don't question authority. Become docile. And the food that we eat will imbalance people to both of these states of consciousness. Not just one or the other, but both. If we're not eating the right foods, if we're not eating nutritious foods that are devoid of toxins... The toxicity of our modern food chain is something we're going to discuss extensively today. So I'm going to uh, check in on my email, see if anybody has answered the alchemical riddle. We have we have a attempt. Okay, so here we go. Let's see. Let's 
Okay, we have an answer from CJB. Okay, CJB says, thank you very much for your show. When you say the poor have a lot of it and the rich not much and the meek value it, but the privileged throw it away, it makes me think of both time and love. Like when you value money over people or over or over intellectualize rather than use your instincts and heart. But if you want only one answer, I'd have to say time. Okay? Both great answers, but unfortunately incorrect. There is one correct answer. I'll, I'll just say that it is a one-word answer. That, that's the only hint I'll give out. And uh, you can try CJB, but that is not the correct answer. That is not what the key to life and death in the uh, riddle is about. And it does look like we are not getting calls uh, uh, coming through the switchboard today. I apologize for that, folks. It's been a, a little bit of a trying time with uh, talk show recently, but try to work out the technical problems. Um, but uh, email is still a way to go. Looks like we have another answer coming through. Uh, Paul says, I want to venture an a answer to your riddle. I say the answer is one or more or all of the following. Love, acceptance, laughter, innocence. Thanks, Paul. Okay. Thank you, Paul. Great attempt. Uh, it is not any of those, um, those answers, but also a great attempt. But um, that is not what the key to life and death that is spoken about in the alch alchemical riddle called Better Living Through Alchemy is. So we have two really great attempts there, but um, not uh, the correct answers to the alchemical riddle. Uh, once again, I just want to give out the email address. We're going to take, uh, take um, answers to this riddle through email today since... Unfortunately, Talk Show is not giving me, uh, is not allowing me to take calls through the switchboard. So, the email address to email to put in an answer, an attempted answer at the, this alchemical riddle, the prize for which is two free tickets to the Free Your Mind conference in April. The email address to send your responses to to send your uh, attempted answers to is whatonearth93 at gmail.com. whatonearth93, the number 93 at gmail.com. In a few more minutes, I'll go back and check some more emails and see if we have a winner. But good attempts, CJB and Paul. So thank you for your responses. Okay, let's get into some aspects of our food and food chain and what this is doing to human consciousness. The first thing we have to understand about the very toxic and poisonous aspects of the foods that we eat are most conventionally grown produce uses large amounts of chemical pesticides and fertilizers to grow the food the way that they grow it. Crops are sprayed to keep pests away from eating them and cutting into the farmer's profits and yields. And they largely do this with conventionally grown fruits and vegetables and grains with chemical pesticides, which kill pests. That's what they, they do. That's why they're called pesticides. They kill bugs and other pests that eat the crops that are grown by farmers. But they have a toxicity that goes into the food that we then consume. And for people that think that you're going to take fruit or produce and you're going to wash it off and that's going to rinse away all of these pesticides, it doesn't work that way. When something is sprayed chemically, it becomes systemic to that food. 
Now, what that means it is, it is it becomes distributed throughout the food. So it doesn't make a difference if you wash it. It is systemic, meaning it is everywhere within the food. When you're eating it, it doesn't make a difference if you take the skin off, if you wash it. None of that matters. It's completely distributed throughout. Systemic. So that's one thing. Chemical pesticides. Chemical fertilizers are used to make soil turn over faster and replenish the nutrients of the soil that are depleted because of the way the crops are grown. If you're going to use natural organic farming techniques, crops will need to be, soil that crops grow in will need to be given a certain amount of time to turn over and then become nutrient dense again. This is often accomplished by rotating crops, which often is not done in conventional farming techniques. This is a reason why organic farming is so important, and choosing organic foods is so important. That's the solution to this. We will get into solutions a bit later, but I want to emphasize the problems with our food first. And the reason I'm doing that is not to be negative, not to inspire fear, it is to educate about what is going on with our food. That if we want to become better and we want to improve our bodies and our health and our minds, we need to get actively involved in changing how our food is grown and produced and sold. And we do that by voting by what we purchase as far as what we choose to eat. When we go to the supermarket or the, the grocery store or the farmer's market to buy food. So... Food producers will listen to what people want. We'll vote through them, you know, we'll vote through what we spend our money on. And if we don't buy garbage, they will stop producing garbage. So that's part of the solution is choosing the right foods. And that's how you'll get food producers to hear this is what people want. That's slowly changing. You see more organic produce um, and products in on supermarket shelves, but it needs to change drastically more. So chemical fertilizers are a big part of the, the negative aspects of the food that we put into our body and how toxic they are and how damaging they can be to health and to consciousness. So Again, I, I say, I bring up the negative to make a diagnosis. And we talked about that word on past shows. If we're going to correct wrongs, if we're going to make changes for the better, we have to look at the negative. The negative cannot be pushed away and ignored. It needs to be faced and confronted. And we, this is how we make a diagnosis about what is ailing us things that are wrong with our society. We know, we can see there's a lot of wrongs, but so few people get down to the core, the causal factors, and that's what this show is all about. So, making a diagnosis, if we break that word down, it's Greek roots. The etymology of the word goes to the Greek. Dia in Greek, D-I-A, means through or by way of. Through, by way of. Okay? Gnosis in Greek means knowledge. So by way of knowledge, we will make a diagnosis. We will find out what is wrong. Then we're in a position of power through that knowledge to then take appropriate action to correct that wrong. And that's called wisdom. Wisdom is what you do with what you know. It's applied knowledge for the right reasons. Okay, so chemical fertilizers. It goes hand in hand with chemical pesticides. These become systemic to the food. That's the critical thing to keep in mind about that aspect of it. So when we look at what generates health, that's what we're, we're focusing on here. What generates health? What we put into our body and mind. So what we're feeding ourselves with is what we become. 
if our food is laden with chemical pesticides and fertilizers, we're putting junk information into our minds, ultimately. Because this is what is nourishing the brain and the active thought processes. If we put low quality information and that capacity into ourselves, we are going to act in a low quality fashion. Our behavior is going to be low quality and base. The next component, and I have a laundry list here, okay? I really, really w was hoping to take callers today because they could bring up more topics of discussion. But unfortunately, again, it doesn't look like we're going to do that. I opened up the chat forum on the Talk Shoe Live program, but it doesn't look like that is uh, coming in. Let me let me expand my screen here and see if I'm able to get anything from that. Let's see. I'll take I'll take um no the, the chat. Okay, uh, it looks like the chat is working. If anybody is still in the uh, talk shoe live forum for my show uh, through talk shoe. Please type something into the chat so I know that it's working through um, the, uh, the guests in the room. Uh, if people can do that, I'd appreciate it because we can take some calls, uh, some questions that way and get some comments from people that way today. Um, let's, it looks like it, uh, allow chat is turned on. Uh, if anybody can uh, type into the forum, if they're hearing uh, what I'm saying, please do so. See if it works. Um, if you want to chime in on the show today, email whatonearth93 at gmail.com. We could uh, take some, some comments that way. The contest is still ongoing for the Alchemical Riddle. That is the first news item on my website. It looks like we have another attempted answer. Okay. R. Clark attempts the answer. He says, a classic Mark Passio style answer to the riddle. And his attempted answer is CARE, with a capital C. A great attempt, R. Clark, but that is not the answer to the alchemical riddle. It looks like we're going to have a tough one with this one. Uh, and that's good, because it will get people thinking, and that's what the whole goal of this really is. And uh, dig down deep and really try to uh, get to the core of this, you know. Um, the key to life and death. The only thing from which the Lapis Philosophorum may be prepared. Uh, care is a phenomenal answer. It is very important. It is a critically important ingredient in the alchemical equation. But that is not the key to life and death. It is something that in many ways needs to be even more deeply treasured as deeply treasured as care with a capital C must be, it is the generative principle. And to go hand in hand with that, um, I'd like to read a quote that I think really encapsulates um, what I'm talking about with food. And people would say, oh, how could this possibly connect me with food? Well, R. Clark, in his attempt at answer, uh, really demonstrates this because what we care enough to do is what we are going to manifest in the world. And that makes perfect common sense. If we don't care enough to change our diet, we don't care en about enough about ourselves to change our diet, I mean, what does that really say for our self-respect level? You know, care has everything to do with what I'm talking about with food. We have to care enough about our own bodies. We have to care enough about our own mind-body connection. We have to care enough about the practices that are used to grow food. I'll be talking a little bit later, maybe even next week, about the processes that take place on factory farms and what we do to animals. And boy, oh boy, is that ever connected with care, with a capital C. So I'd like to just briefly read a couple of quotes from an occult tome that is called The Rosicrucian Cosmo Conception by the Rosicrucian philosopher Max Heindel. 
And he talks about care in one of the sections of this book. And it, it, it brings up some of the positive aspects of occultism. And again, we'll talk about this as the weeks go on. We will have whole sections, a whole shows devoted to different occult principles and uh, schools of thought. But just briefly, I'd like to read something from Max Heindel. He says in his book, The Rosicrucian Cosmo Conception, that the ignorant use of the generative force is primarily responsible for all of the pain, sickness, and sorrow that we experience. That is so profound. And what he means by the generative force is care. Care with a capital C. That's the generative principle. What could be called the eighth or binding principle of all of the hermetic principles. And, of course, this is a highly prized um, concept in Rosicrucianism as well. So, the ignorant use of the generative force is primarily responsible for the pain, sickness, and sorrow that we experience. I don't think any truer words have ever been spoken. What we care about is what we experience. What we do not care about and choose to ignore, we will experience in a different form. Especially if the universe is attempting to call those things to our attention and we are willfully ignoring them. Sadly, this is what is happening with the sickness and pain and sorrow that people undergo through the physical illnesses that they experience because of what they choose to eat. They are not making a higher consciousness informed decision about the food which they take into their bodies. I'd like to read another short quote from this book where he talks about care and innocence and wisdom. So he's basically talking about that which we pay attention to. And this has everything to do with food, believe it or not. In the aspect he's talking about here, yes, it's about something higher. But this can be applied to the choices that we make when it comes to what we put into our body. He says that innocence is not synonymous with virtue, with a capital V, true virtue. Innocence is the child of ignorance, with a capital I, and, and could not be maintained in a universe where the purpose of evolution is the acquisition of wisdom. To attain that end, a knowledge of good and evil, right and wrong, is essential. Also, choice of action is essential. <laughs> Excuse me. If having knowledge and choice, man ranges himself on the side of good and right, he cultivates virtue and wisdom. If he succumbs to temptation and does wrong knowingly, he fosters vice. What he's talking about is willful ignorance, willful choosing of that which one knows to be wrong. And I bring this up deliberately on this show because I see this all around me. And it's a painful thing to talk about because it affects members of my own family. And I'm not somebody that is going to just hold back personal things. You've heard me talk about, you know, family issues before on the show, I like to bring things right home to where they roost, okay, and not hold back or not, not be afraid to air things out and explain to people, these problems of consciousness exist right in my own family with people that I care about, and they persist, and they want, they for some reason, want to suffer more, they want to choose the wrong, they want to continue the path of ignorance. 
because they're so rooted in and attached to the way that they do things, they don't want to say the three biggest words, the three most powerful words that can ever be uttered by the human voice, and that is, I was wrong. The ego has bound them so completely that they would rather choose ignorance, sickness, sorrow, pain, suffering, unto death if it comes to that, rather than admit they were duped, they were deceived, they were simply wrong, they simply didn't have the information, and they don't want to look at new information and then use their will to change their behavior. It is it is largely been conditioned out of them, and this is completely connected to the alchemical key to life and death. One of the reasons that the will has been taken out of them is because this thing has been also removed and thrown away. So there's another hint. Let's check the email and see if anybody else uh, has come up with a correct answer. Uh, no other, no other attempt so far. I'll give the email address again. If anybody has an attempt to answer the alchemical riddle on the news section of my website, whatonearthishappening.com. It's the first news item. It's called Better Living Through Alchemy, and it is a riddle. The prize to answering the question, what is the key to life and death that is spoken about in this document? The, the, the prize is two free tickets to the Free Your Mind conference in April of 2011 in Philadelphia. Please only submit an answer to the question if you want to attend the conference and you have the capability of attending it. Please don't give the answer and let people who, you know, would have been able to attend had they given the correct answer. I don't want to give it out over the air and then the person not attend. Give the answer out over the air and then that, that person not attend. Please only answer if you want to attend and can attend this conference in Philadelphia in April. And if you uh, get the right answer to that question, I will send you, I will get your uh, mailing address through, through email and I will send you two free tickets. Okay. Continuing with food and why it, this has everything to do with care and attention. It's because we have to become aware of what's in the food that's harmful and often toxic and poisonous. And then we have to use that knowledge to change our choices. That's how this process works. And no one said it was easy. The word easy is not being talked about here. Okay? Simple, yes. Because this information is available. And it, it, only through a, a minimal amount of seeking, not even that arduous seeking. Okay? Just wanting to improve yourself, having the desire to improve your body mind connection. See, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little anecdote here, folks. I was not always the most healthy eater in the world, and that's the biggest laughable understatement that I think I have uttered on the air since I've been doing this show. To say that I was not a healthy eater in the past is a big belly laugh of an understatement. Okay? I ate sewage, I ate junk. I ate tons and tons of sugar. I ate tons and tons of fatty meats and red meat. Okay? Tons of white refined flour and dough and bread, pretzels and potato chips and snack foods and fast foods and, you know, Wendy's triple burgers, you know, with, with extra cheese. Okay? I mean, my diet was horrendous. Horrendous is not even the word. A, a, an atrocity. An atrocity. Now, to go from that to the organic vegetarian diet that I eat now is a 180-degree reversal. It's like a completely different person emerged when I started eating differently. And I'm going to tell you some of the sources that I looked into to change my diet. I'll, I'll post some movies to the site. We'll post some uh, some uh, documents, perhaps, 
and put you on to some authors and, and uh, presenters who can explain, often who are doctors and, and scientists in their own right, who can explain at high level uh, terms what is going on with our food chain. And one of the people who really helped me, many people don't like him, but I think he's a phenomenal person, and he has really opened my eyes to what goes on in food and, pharmaceut and the pharmaceutical industries, was Kevin Trudeau. Kevin Trudeau, the author of Natural Cures They Don't Want You to Know About, one of the best books I've ever read on the topic of food. I think another person who is indispensable toward my understanding of food was Russell Blaylock, neuroscientist, neurosurgeon, actually, I should say. Russell Blaylock. Ian Crane helped me become aware of certain things. Uh, Dr. Rima Labo. And there's many others. We can go on and on. And I'll, I'll give some references later in the show. So at the top of the second hour... Unfortunately, it doesn't look like I'm going to be able to take calls through the talk shoe, um, through the talk shoe um, switchboard. So it looks like the talk shoe chat is working, and uh, you can send emails to whatonearth93 at gmail.com to make comments and suggestions. Now, I have a laundry list of things. We're not going to get all into them tonight. We will probably go into a second week on food alone because this is such a gigantic topic. A whole show can be done about this. We looked at chemical pesticides and fertilizers. What about preservatives that are added to food? This is largely done to keep food on shelves for longer periods of time. And these are chemical additives. Someone just recently did a time-lapse movie of McDonald's French fries. He bought McDonald's French fries, didn't eat them, put them on a table, did time-lapse photography of the fries for a six-month period of time. And at the end of six months, the fries looked exactly like he did the day he purchased them. And you people think that's natural? That this could possibly mean that eating something like that is good for you? It's not even food anymore. Natural food spoils, in case you don't know that. It's not meant to stay permanently the way that it is. And secondly, that's something they're giving you right there on the spot for you to eat. What would it need to stay like that for? It shows you how much chemicals are in them. There's no reason for McDonald's fries to stay, stay that long. Are they going to be on the shelf for six months? They're being served to you right there when you walk into that garbage facility. But, you know, it's, it's amazing. Six months, and the fries look exactly as they did the day that they were bought. And people are gobbling these things down. I used to. I'll tell you, I, I, don't, I don't talk about things that I haven't changed in myself. Okay? I've made this change. People who are not eating right can make this change. It's just a matter of willpower. It's a matter of a little bit of knowledge. And then, largely, it's a matter of turning on the will. But you have to have that tool in your arsenal, willpower. It can be that can be done. Will it be chosen? That's up to you. If you understand it's the right thing to do, that's the first step. That's where care comes into the equation. Then will has to be exercised. You know, if you want to become better, if you want to change your diet, that's care. The knowledge part about it is what I'm trying to contribute to. Like giving you information about what's in our food now. And then will has to be exercised. And these are the three components. I'm going to type something to the people in the chat forum. Just 
asking people if anyone in the forum wants to take a shot at the alchemy riddle. Let me check my email address again and see if there are any other attempts. It looks like there are. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we have a winner. Diana Smith. Hello, Diana. Uh, I'm, I'm familiar with Diana. I, I, I know her. Um, Diana Smith has the correct answer to the alchemical riddle. She is the winner of the two tickets to the Free Your Mind conference. Diana Smith, you get a weekend pass to Free Your Mind. I'll email you and uh, give you the... Um, uh, uh, I'll, I'll let you give, give me your um, mailing address so I can send those out to you after November 5th. Ladies and gentlemen, the answer to the riddle of alchemy, the key to life and death, and I'll just read the first paragraph of this again before I give the answer, which was given first by Diana Smith of Philadelphia. The key to life and death is everywhere to be found. But if you do not find it in your own house, you will find it nowhere. Yet, it is before everyone's eyes. No one can live without it. Everyone has used it. The poor usually possess it more than the rich. Children play with it in the streets. The meek and uneducated esteem it highly, but the privileged and learned often throw it away. It is the only thing from which the philosopher's stone can be prepared, and without it, no noble metal can be created. The answer, which was correctly given first by Diana Smith, is imagination. The imagination is the key to life and death. It is that thing from which the Philosopher's Stone can be prepared. If we cannot imagine a better outcome, we cannot create one. If we cannot imagine a different way of being, we cannot make that way of being become manifest in our experience or in our world. This faculty of humanity has been devastated in our current civilization. It is pounded out of our children mercilessly through the so-called education system, which we talked about weeks ago. It is indoctrinated out of our youth. And that is why we are stuck in the rut of consciousness that we are. So, excellent job, Diana. I will be emailing you after the show to get your address, and I will send you to Free tickets to For Your Mind after uh, November 5th. The, the tickets go on sale November 5th, so shortly thereafter I will put them in the mail uh, to you. Well done. Imagination, folks. That's it. That's what it's all about. So... That is handled, and let's get back to our discussion on food. Chemical pesticides, chemical fertilizers, chemical preservatives, processed foods. The way that foods are generally processed often rob them of their nutrient values. The more, the more processed a food is, the less nutrient-dense it becomes. That's why staying away from pre-packaged foods. See, they, they'll, they'll try to sell you on this for your convenience. But eating fresh foods don't need to be packaged. Okay? Kept in containers is what is a much healthier choice than eating processed and prepackaged foods. Now, again, none of this I'm saying is to be so 100% gung-ho okay, that you are paranoid about everything you put into your mouth. That's not what I'm saying here. I'm saying start 
changing the way you look at food. Start changing your awareness of what's in food. Do some research. Then start changing slowly what you eat. Get off of bad foods. Get onto organic foods. Get off of prepackaged foods. Get off of um, foods that are chock full of preservatives and, and processed heavily. Fresh organic foods are the key. So processing and prepackaging, often sold to us for convenience sake, often not good to put into the body. They are nutrient deficient foods. Colors and dyes added to food, especially children's foods. I, I'd like to uh, take the time uh, briefly to thank Carb, my, my girlfriend Barb, for helping me to compile this list. We went through and thought of um, all of the, this whole laundry list of components of everything that is being done to our food over the last uh, day. And uh, she did a great job helping me to compile this. And uh, I, you know, will go through this list, and I'm sure listeners will bring up more topics. So um, today we're going through email and the chat session on the um, talk to uh, live board because the call-in function does not appear to be working. If anybody wants to try to call in, go right ahead. I think you'll confirm that uh, that function doesn't seem to be working. Um, you can try it, and uh, we can see. But uh, no one seems to have called in thus far, so I don't think that that is working properly. Um, the email address, if you want to chime in on the discussion tonight, is what on earth 93 at gmail.com. Then we had a winner to the uh, Better Living Through Alchemy Riddle, and that was Diana Smith from Philadelphia. So great job, Diana. The answer was imagination. Going back to uh, the discussion about food, dyes. You know, you, you look at packaging and you see this dye color, that dye color. All artificial and chemical additives to change the color of food to make it look a certain way. All unnecessary. All harmful. These are things that are harmful to the body. They do not need to be in our diet. Chemical pesticides, chemical fertilizers, chemical preservatives... Processed foods, added dyes, okay? Bleaching, the process of bleaching. This is done through sugar, flour. Even eggs are bleached white. I was telling uh, a friend, eggs don't come out of chickens white. They come out of chickens brown. Certain chickens lay eggs with like a bluish hue or hint to them. But eggs don't come out of chickens white. They are, they are bleached to become white like that. People associate this idea of things that are white with purity and as far as food goes, not, nothing is farther from the truth. You know, white flour, white breads, white sugar, refined sugar. Th these are all things that are not good and have low nutrient value. White refined, refined flour is completely nutrient it's devoid of nu nutrition. White refined sugar has no nutritional value. Th and that brings us to the next topic. Sugar. Excessive amounts of sugar. Refined white sugar in tons and tons of foods that we eat. And even worse than that, high fructose corn syrup. Someone just chimed in on dyes and said red dye causes a neurologic, neurological allergy. This person has an autistic son and becomes moody and withdrawn when, whenever he, eating something with the red dyes in it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it looks like uh, we're getting some callers in. Let's see if we can uh, take a call here. Caller Hello? Name, caller named Brian. You're on What on Earth is Happening. How are you? Yeah. Hi. I was just uh, texting the phone for you. Great. It looks like but I want to commend you. I've never, I've never been on this show before, and 
you're right down my alley. I'm a health nut, and uh, I really agree with everything you're saying. Great. It looks like the uh, 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 talk shoe function came back online. It didn't look like it was working earlier. I got a couple of error messages through the switchboard, and now it looks like it's back. So uh, give the call in number again since we're into the second hour. Uh, Brian, did you have something something else, or uh, was that all you wanted to say? Because I, I'm going to give the No, I just, I, just, I just wanted to help you with the phone check, you know. Uh, and also, I wanted to commend you for what you're doing and give you a lot of credit. You people know how to eat right. I, I thank you very much. Thanks for calling in and, and uh, testing that out for me, and thanks for the kind words. You have a good day. Okay, so um, uh, it, it is the call-in function seems to be working again. The call-in number, 724-444. 7444. The call ID number 83515. Once again, the call in number 724 The call ID number 83515. You're listening to What on Earth is Happening. I'm your host, Mark Passio. My website, whatonearthishappening.com. The network's website, revolutionbroadcasting.com. Here we go. Next caller, you're on What on Earth is Happening. What do you have for us? Hello, Mark. It's Kevin, actually. I just wanted to call in and touch base and mention that, yes, your phone system was working as well. And specifically to mention that I was actually the gentleman who obviously just typed into your chat about having the autistic son and how specifically red guys have become but a serious detriment to his cognitive ability. And so we have completely eliminated them from his diet. They tend to, as I mentioned in the chat, uh, give him almost what seems to me like a neurological allergy of sorts, for lack of a better word, where he becomes moody, withdrawn, and more specifically, and, and most frightening for me, is his he sometimes flat out becomes like violent because his cognitive abilities are not functioning properly. It's almost like I don't know. It's, I know he doesn't get exact. He doesn't get anything like migraine headaches. But I, I know when I personally go through those sorts of things, it reminds me very much of that sort of mentality in him. Right, right. That, that's amazing. And uh, I, I'm I'm sorry to, to hear about uh, his condition. I I, w I don't think I was aware of that previously. Um, yeah, uh, it's it, it's terrible some of the things that they're putting into the foods and expecting children to eat in particular. And dyed foods are a huge thing in children's food. Uh, and, and it's just you know this corroborates it that this is toxic and it is detrimental to proper brain function. And we got to get our kids off of this stuff and get them on the natural, holistic, um, you know, organic foods. Uh, we have definitely altered his diet to make it much more uh, appropriate for him, for sure. And it, it, has, it has helped definitely removing that from him. Uh, there are times when somebody will accidentally even just give him a red lollipop pen for literally hours, if not sometimes days, we've had it really bad at one point, he just becomes despondent or or angry wow. as in a very strange fashion. It's almost like a, I, it's almost like how I get personally when I am in a moody lack of sleep state, but definitely much more. I don't know. There seems to be a specific nature to it. I can't explain it. And it seems like it's all developed since we gave him his first couple of sets of shots for fun. But when he got his three-year shots, whatever it was then, or the end, or towards the end of his two-year shots it was, he got a grouping of shots, a hole in one, and one little needle. And ever since then, like during those during the first couple of months, then he definitely was going through the same types of issues. Right. And it took us a while to figure out what's been going on. I, I, I don't think we'd have even known it if we hadn't gotten him the early intervention care through his school, as, as because we sent him to school so early through a Montessori charter school in Philadelphia. 
we were actually really lucky that we got that information um, when we did it and, and have been able to correct things and have tailored his entire life away from anything that would further exacerbate any of his what's called PDGNOS. It's a mild form of autism, essentially. It's pervasive developmental delay, not otherwise specified. So as as much as I understand the science behind it or lack thereof at this point because they, they can't give enough information, hence the not otherwise specified part right. of the NOS, the PDD NOS, but specifically what really kind of messes everything up is that it, he has this ability to be a very willful child and doesn't want to give up that sense of will. And so schools often have labeled him as being um, Let me guess. aggressive Let me guess. or... Oppositional, yeah, defiant. Defiant. oppositional defiant. Yes, oppositional and defiant, correct, yes. Yes, and, and so to the point that... that it's a new disorder that, they're, that, that these uh, psychiatrists are diagnosing. You know, and then their, their solution of what we're going to talk about next week is drugs. Their solution is drugging the children, you know, putting them on these uh, – the speed is essentially what it is, these forms of amphetamines that basically make the, uh, the synapses in the brain go so haywire that they become like uh, zombies. Okay, that they yeah, just that will not be happening to my son. He will not be getting those medications. He is fortunately in a, in a very good school right now in such a way that realistically all of the added help they're now giving him could in theory make him out to be a better, as strange as this sounds, and I, I'm not going to say that I like any of this, but specifically how it started, but in the end, all of the problems with autism that he has at this moment in time are all things that are correctable through speech therapy. And in going through the speech therapy that he is currently in, it is actually going to set him up in such a fashion that he will wind up, by the time he's done going through it all, be in a position where he is actually shocked as this is, better off than most people because he will have a lot of the aspects of autism that are actually really good for a human person, like uh, the Asperger's specifically. And then since we have gotten him over the difficult humps, he will have those good aspects as well as being a normal kid. So I'm strangely thankful, but it will be in a very long run. And it is not something I recommend to any parent, as a matter of fact, that even goes to far as to say that realistically at this point in time, considering medical technology and at least my paranoia thereof, I personally would never allow any kid to ever get another shot as such ever again. And if I ever do have kids, I swear, <laughs> no doctor will be happy to bring a needle anywhere near my kid. This will be the topic of discussion probably in a couple of weeks, because I'll probably extend to, uh, talking about food uh, over next week. And then the following week, we will get into drugs, medications. Um, we'll get into uh, the whole pharmaceutical industry, uh, treating symptoms instead of going down to root causes through, through drugs and surgery. Uh, we'll get into vaccines, flu shots, uh, HMOs and insurance companies, and uh, one of my uh, most you know de deplorable topics of discussion, which is uh, the antidepressants. People who, who know me know that that's one of the things that I uh, st stand out against the most because of what they basically do to the emotions, which is uh, one of our greatest gifts that we possess as uh, a human the human species. And um, the uh, SSRI drugs we'll talk about also. And, yeah, this is what they want to do with kids. They want to diagnose disorders that don't really exist, make up new things so that they can sell them more drugs, shoot them up with more uh, shots, and, um, and get them hooked on uh, drugs that they don't need. That, that largely, you know, even if there is some sort of an imbalance, the, the, the thing the way to treat it is through the change of diet. 
changing the child's diet and getting them off of garbage foods and onto a good, healthy, organic diet, you, could, you would be amazed at the, uh, the level of improvement in behavior and cognitive function that children will experience when their diet is changed for the better. We don't need to put them on drugs, you know? And I highly recommend the movie Generation RX, and I'll, I'll bring that up next week and the week after. But that's a, a great film that d discusses this very topic. So, uh, Kev, I'm uh, you know, sorry to hear about that trouble with your son. He's a great kid. Uh, you know, I've, I've met him, and uh, he, he's, he's wonderful. I hope uh, you, know, you work that out and uh, keep, uh, keep going forward, uh, getting him onto you know, the right foods, and uh, things will improve. Thank you very much, Mark. Keep up the great work. Uh, I, I really love your show, and to God, someone is actually saying this trip. Have a good one, then. Kevin, thank you so much. So take care. It's always, um, you know, even more painful to hear about when children are suffering because of this, and, uh, you know, uh, that's another thing. I mean, we need to do this not just for our... Um, ourselves, but for future generations to come. So, you know, people are bringing up different things. Uh, I'm going to go on in the chat. I'll get to that. I want to uh, talk a little bit about um, um, cytotoxins. Okay, We talked about refined white sugar, which is in a lot of things, and high fructose corn syrup, which is increasingly being added to just about everything. And th these can act like cytotoxins if taken in large enough dosages. But artificial sweeteners, man, are these things to stay away from. These are categorized as excitotoxins by many neuroscientists and neurosurgeons. Um, what they do when they hit the, the brain is they actually open up barriers in the blood-brain barrier. They open up the blood-brain barrier so that toxins that can no normally would be filtered out of out of the uh, the uh, blood system through the blood br not being able to pass through the blood brain barrier get into the brain and they become neurotoxins. This is a class of chemicals that is known as um, excitatory neuro excit excitatory neurotransmitters. Excitatory neurotransmitters. They are otherwise known as excitotoxins. Okay? E x c i t o t o x i n s. Excitotoxins. And this is the whole category of artificial sweeteners. Nutrasweet, aspartame, um, uh, sucralose, Splenda, um, you know, Equal. You name it. All of the, 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 the packs of uh, pink, blue, and yellow garbage. That's what I'm talking about here. Stay away from that stuff. It is damaging to the nervous system, to the central nervous system. Absolutely. And connected with uh, something someone is talking about, somebody said, what is good for anxiety? Well, wh one is to get off of toxic, poisonous foods, and definitely don't drink or eat anything with uh, artificial sweeteners in it, because that will do things to the nervous system that you w will not want happening, okay? It opens up the blood-brain barrier. It gets, allows things into the central nervous system that would ordinarily be filtered out. That's what excitotoxins are, okay? It will make people jittery. It will make people have headaches. Okay, th this is shown connected with migraines, with cytotoxins and artificial sweeteners. It will reduce cognitive function and ability to concentrate. A whole host of things go along with that. There are natural things that help with uh, anxiety, like St. John's work has been shown to be a little bit of effective. You've got to watch what you take, take it with. You can't take it with uh, any kind of a uh, um, MAO inhibitor. Uh, monoamine oxidase inhibitor. And again, I'm not, I, I'm in no way providing health advice. I'm not a doctor, okay? I'm not a scientist. I've researched these things. I would highly encourage you research these things. Don't take my word for any of this. You do your own research when it comes to this. And then 
you know, read studies, read reports, understand what other people are saying about this. I, I, I would highly recommend people look at Russell Blaylock's work, specifically on artificial sweeteners as neurotoxins. He wrote a book called um, uh, Excitotoxins, The Taste That Kills, is what his book was called. I recommend people read that. I recommend you watch the video of the same name. He has a lecture uh, video out on Google Video. Maybe I'll post it uh, with the podcast today. I see we have another caller, so let's go to the phones. Here we go. Caller from Southeast Pennsylvania. You're on What on Earth is Happening. Hey, how you doing? Mark, right? Yes, how are you? Good. Uh, it's Dan. Um, I actually walk outside. I was in the chat to get a signal. Um, I don't. I don't have a question with the, you know, regards to the topic tonight per se. Does that matter? No, go right ahead. Okay. So um, I I stumbled upon this, um, you know, this uh, what's going on. Only a couple months ago, I had my accident actually because I actually was uh, wanting to download a movie, The uh, Most Dangerous Man in America, and it turns out somebody switched it to um, to a Cooper documentary. Which, um, yeah, which, and rightfully so, I think, I think Clinton called him that. But, um, uh, so anyway, when I saw what he had predicted in his June, uh, 2001 broadcast, <clears throat> I immediately knew something was, was, was trolling here. And, uh, that's what started this whole thing. And just, uh, two months later, and, uh, you know, deeper and deeper we go, I go. And and I just to tell you, all the people I know and uh friends, I mean there's I, I just I have no idea what to do with this burden of info or uh or, or for that matter to find anyone that would even share this opinion. I mean even close to it. And I found you kind of an accident because I was looking at meetups okay. or something else and then anyway. So that's my question is what does one do? This burden of, of of information, you know. I, I'm in the Chester County area, but uh, anyway, that's my question. If you can answer, <laughs> I struggle with the same thing. Uh, you know, it, it is burdensome. Uh, one, once you have a, a, a larger picture, it, it can be a burden. The the, the 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 task that we have basically assigned ourselves by taking on this knowledge is to disseminate it as widely and as freely as possible and to make ourselves available as conduits of information. And that is what the great work is, as I talked about briefly on the show last week and uh, uh, the, the caller Bob from Cincinnati uh, uh, reiterated and brought up. Um, the great work is to understand these truths and then speak them. The universe is spoken into existence. The reason that we're in the mess that we're in is that the people with the really poisonous worldview and way of being and way of living in the world have propagated it unwaveringly through their voice. They have continuously put out and reinforced this message of deceit. And it is our sure. task to undo that. It is our task to combat that with the voice of truth. And I, I, I struggle with that myself. I want more people to pay attention. I'm tired of hearing denial. I'm tired of hearing ignorance being spoken all around. It, it, it is very They'll awesome. so fight you to the bitter end on it, too. They don't want... The ego. The ego is the most powerful thing that is holding these people where they are. You can't break but I also think this question. Mm -hmm. If I can ask you this, what I get a lot is, okay, well, well, what are we supposed to do, and what are, what are you going to do? And I know you've probably heard that. So, what are we supposed to do? And what I would say, you have to understand the the, the totality of the big picture, the the tapestry of all of this information as it pertains to what's going on in the world and how it affects our lives on a day-to-day -day basis, and then put it into a format that can be readily understood by other individuals, and then share that information with whoever will accept any part of it. That's what there is to do. Unfortunately, that's it. This is an information war. That's what it is. It's very accurate, that term. 
Um, what changes us is information. But connected with that, there has to be care enough to take it in. There has to be will enough to change. You know, we have to care about it. We have to change the quality of our attention and help others to change the quality of their attention. And then we have to use the, our will to continue to do the right thing. And it's not easy. I think it's enough. I think it's enough to make a, a dent. In, in, uh, I mean, it seems like the hours a day are, are on, are on uh, fast forward, you know? Yeah. Oh, they know, and, that there's an they know that there's an awakening happening. They're well aware of the, the, the collective consciousness of humanity is on the rise in general. And that's why they're scrambling to try to keep their power. You know, this is them scrambling to try to move their agenda into fast forward mode to keep the power they already have. Not, not to increase it more, but to hold on to what they have because people are becoming aware that they've been played. And they're waking up to that fact and they're starting to take action and do something about it. And that's their worst nightmare, especially if that begins to happen in any large numbers. So keep doing what you're doing. Keep doing what you're doing. Keep taking in info, but then disseminate it as well. You have to give it out. You have to be like a pressure release valve. Take it in, but then put it back out there. Okay. Last quick it, question. You keep it in, it'll build up pressure. You know, and that's what I see okay. in a lot of people. You know, a lot of people keep learning, 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 but they're not putting the, the info out there. They're timid. They don't want to speak it. You have to speak it. That's what it's all ultimately about. Change happens through how we use our voice and our will. So, so go ahead, your other question? I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. You know, how do you find other people you know, um, you know, nearby or wherever? Yeah. Because it doesn't seem like that's an easy thing to do. It, it, it isn't, but what you already mentioned, meetup.com, uh, is an excellent resource for that. You know, you could type a topic that you're interested in or want to learn more about it into meetup, and uh, that that will lead you to other people that have similar interests and ways of thinking. So that's a good resource. Um, there's a group in, are, are you in the Philadelphia area or are you outside outside of this region? Uh, yeah, in the um, Chinatown area. Okay. Truth, Freedom, Prosperity is a great group to, to become involved with. They're, they're, they, you know, they do these uh, documentaries that I usually announce every third Monday of the month at the Ethical Society. That would be a, a good resource. The End the Fed group that, that has... Uh, you know, it's generally organized through Truth, Freedom, and Prosperity, but and the Fed. Um, you have um, the Tesla Science Foundation of Philadelphia that is into free energy and the whole, you know, control of energy, and and that led a lot of people into this topic. Uh, you know, into seeing the big picture. For for example, I was at uh, David Ike this Sunday in New York City at the Nokia Center, and. Um, we sat next to a gentleman. We just happened to get into a conversation with him and asked him, you know, what got you into all of this? What got you into David Icke, all of this material? And he just answered with one word, Tesla. And we happened to be sitting next to him, and that's a foundation that I work with in the Philadelphia area. He said, I was interested in alternative forms of energy. I started researching Tesla, and that opened up the whole can of worms when I understand why they suppressed his technologies. And I was like, wow, that is truly amazing and synchronistic. That's what led that person there. He, he was from Milwaukee. Um, so... Um, uh, just amazing. What, We've never made that connection. Yeah, what, what will be someone's end point? You never know what that end point will be. You know, some for some it's food. For some it's energy. For some it's the occult. For some it's politics. It, it, it's, for some it's UFOs. You know, there's a, a million different end points. I'll tell you, one of the things that got me into all of this, believe it or not, looking into the UFO and the crop circle phenomenon when I was young, I mean, I, I was ravenous for information about this, and it opened up one thing into another, into another, into another, into another. And, you know, being involved in the occult myself when I was younger, that, you know, really had a profound impact and helped me see what the real power structure was. So, so you, you truly believe that they suppressed uh, the UFO information. Do you, do you think there's any danger? And because a lot of people feel like they're going to stage, you know, a UFO type of situation. That, you know, I think that's the biggest danger in the whole thing is a is a, a cosmic right. false flag. And if we thought that 9/11 was a big false flag, and that just affected New York City and America in general, you know, Western civilization as a whole, if you want to take it to its extreme, um, wait until they try to pull a cosmic false flag. Okay, and we shouldn't be fearful about that. We should be helping people understand what false flag terrorism, what false flag events are, okay, 
and they can see where know. they could try something like that. How easy would it be? It would be very easy. They would have to project through some form of holographic technology, which is already very developed in the civilian sector. Imagine where it is in the military sector. Okay. You project the holographic well, Hooper, Hooper says they have. They already have, uh, you know, this type of uh, I technology. Have, I, it would not surprise me one bit. Uh, if they produced right. a hologram in the sky and detonated a bomb on the ground below it, people would freak out and be ready to hand over all their freedoms to protect us from the deadly aliens. So that needs right. to be brought yeah. to people's attention. Absolutely. Absolutely. It needs to be brought to people's attention. Meanwhile, nuts, right? Well, for... <laughs> That's the only problem. I'm not saying that all extraterrestrial beings or extra-dimensional beings, whatever the case may be, are all benevolent. That isn't the case. There's ranges of consciousness in their domain as well. And some may be benevolent toward us, some may be malevolent toward us. And we have to be discerning about that and understand it's not just one thing happening. It's something I don't talk about much on the show or in my presentation because I look at that as... It, 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 what I talk about is something that I have come to a, a comfortable level of knowing that, that this is the way that it is actually unfolding. So I kind of leave those things because I, I don't discourage from people when they're looking into them. I definitely think these are areas of tremendous interest, and you can really expand consciousness by looking into these areas. And I'll tell you what, as an anecdote, um, the, the group that I work with in this city, and I, I, you know, I, this, people may be weirded out by this. People may think that this is uh, uh, very appropriate. People may think it's strange. But I work with all these different groups. The highest consciousness group that I work with is the UFO community, uh, particularly the discussion group that takes place at Term Books uh, on the, the second Thursday of every, of every uh, month. And I never miss that group. I, I may miss a, a festival meeting here and there. I may miss a, a Survive and Thrive, another group that I go to here and there. I may miss a, uh, uh, you know, a, t a Truth, Freedom, Prosperity meeting. I don't miss those discussion groups with the UFO community because this is the group that is taking in the big picture. They're seeing all the interconnectedness of all the different things that are going on. And I Where's come that? out of that group feeling invigorated. Germ Books, it's a bookstore in the Frank, uh, the, uh, on Frankfurt Avenue in the Fishtown section of Philly. And uh, they have a, a, a discussion group on UFOs, uh, extraterrestrial phenomenon, crop circles, just the general paranormal and unknown in general. You know, it, it, it varies, all, it goes off into different tangents. They get into the political discussions, discussions about freedom, discussions about consciousness. You name it, it's discussed there. They see the interconnectedness of all of this. And uh, I come out of there, a few, it's the only group that I come out of that I have dealings with in this region that I come out feeling truly invigorated. And I'm not afraid to say that. And I'll, I'll, I'll say that to the, all the people that participate in there. I, I love going to that group with you guys and taking part in it. I think uh, it is the group that is the most advanced in consciousness in this whole region. It's uh, is there, a germ book. Is there a collective discussion? Yes. Oh, sure. Oh, go ahead. Is there a collective um, agreement or, or um, as to what this New World Order mission is, this ultimate, what is the end game? Because you know, I, mean, I hear so many things. It depends on which New World Order you're talking about. You know, is it the New World Order that is being erected to block out the light, or is it the New World Order that's being erected to bring in the light? And if it's the New World Order that you're talking about, the block out the light, the dark New World Order agenda, well, their end goal is the total enslavement of all life. They want all life to be enslaved, to be completely miserable and under total dominance. And it's the difference, I talk about this, but there's only really two forms of rulership or state of, of consciousness. There is monarchy and there is anarchy. That's it. There's no in-between. All the in-between states are illusory. Okay? Now, both of these states of consciousness are real. Both of these states of rulership are real. And I'm going to shock everybody. I believe in and want both of them, not just one of them. Okay? But you have to understand the distinction between these two states. 
and their internal and external manifestations. See, monarchy, right, is one ruler. Anarchy is no ruler. That's all those terms mean. One ruler and no ruler. Okay? When there is internal anarchy, meaning that a being does not rule the kingdom of the self, they do not know thyself, so they have no rulership over their internal kingdom. They don't understand the components of their consciousness and how they manifest the reality that they experience. That person is in a state of internal anarchy, meaning they do not possess self-rulership. They are not a sovereign. Okay? They are not monarch of self. The one ruler of self, the king or queen, uh, internally of themselves, the only thing you're allowed to be ruler of, okay? There will be external monarchy. There will be a force that wants to rule over that being as the one, its one ruler, a monarch, ruling over the anarchist being because they're in a state of internal anarchy. So the more of us are in internal anarchy, the, more, the closer we're going to progress toward external monarchy which is tyranny, which is external tyranny, is what it is. Now, the more of us have become true monarchs, and see, th there's occult connections to this, folks. That's why the monarch program is called what it is. They want to usurp the true monarchy, okay? They want to usurp that transformative process. The monarch the caterpillar becomes the monarch butterfly. A process of spiritual transformation is, is, is resonated through that transformation of the caterpillar into the butterfly. Therefore, the Monarch Mind Control Program, that's a, a joint project between intelligence agencies and occult organizations, okay, they usurp that name and make it their own, okay? We need to become internal monarchs, rule the kingdom of the self, and in that kingdom there is only one ruler, each individual. And when that happens, when each individual becomes an internal monarch, the one ruler over the kingdom of self, a sovereign being, a, ki a sovereign king, a sovereign queen, over their, their own consciousness, then there will result external anarchy. There will be no rulership over other individual beings. That is what the great work is, to make that process of transformation happen within the beings on this planet. And it's the hardest work there is to do anywhere in the universe. And welcome, welcome to that work. It's not easy. Yeah, I, and I appreciate that very much. And it's just, uh, you know, all that I've learned, all that we've tried for, and I have a family and kids, and, it's like, and, and all that we thought to do and pursue and prepare for it's like well now what do we just keep going on this on this road or you know, yes, yes, uh, much of it was false <laughs> we just continue on with the, the false notions oh you're uh, like that is, do they just keep well, going on with the false paradigm yeah that's what a lot of people seem to well even, even me you know, even directing my kids or, or what, what we plan to do in the future to do anything and at this point it just seems like to change um, takes a lot of willpower, but more than anything else, it takes courage. Courage is the internal quality that, when directed outward, becomes will. And to unify that, okay, that process, we need to combine it with intelligence or higher level of awareness, seeing things from a new perspective, and with the care to want to do it. You have to care with a capital C to want to do the great work. You have to want to do it not just because it's, it can result in something better for you or even for anybody else. You have to want to do it because you know in your heart it's the right thing to do. That's right thing to do, sure. sure. That's ultimately what this is all about, and that's where you can find the, the will and the courage to keep moving forward. And that's why as discouraged as I become, and I become discouraged, man. I'm not, I'm, I'm not a shiny, happy person. Believe me, anybody that knows me can tell you that, okay? I am, I am discouraged in a lot of ways where what people are choosing. They continue to choose fear over the force of expanded awareness, consciousness, and love. And I see the decisions that they're making that are totally self-detrimental uh, and self-punishing and self-torturing. 
I don't understand their decisions to do that. But that doesn't mean I'm going to give up. Even if I go down with the ship, I'm not giving up. And that, that it will mean that I may not succeed, but I, 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 I haven't failed. So, you know, I, I want to thank someone last night, Sarai, for giving me a pep talk on this because I was pretty discouraged. And she said, look, you haven't failed if you try your best. And, the, you know, and David Ike ended his talk with this as well. It was very synchronistic. Synchronistic. But Ike ended his talk with this. This person did not go or hear the talk. And then she said to me yesterday the same thing he ended his talk with. That if we have tried our best, we haven't failed. Even if we haven't accomplished the goal that we think we need to accomplish, right? The, the, the work is done within. That's where the great work is accomplished. So we can make that new world order happen within, not the, their external, horrible, torturous, uh, slave, uh, enslaved new world order. We want to make a positive, enlightened new world order happen. But that happens once we make that world happen within. And that's what was referred to as the kingdom of God. Do you have any faith in any political figures at all? Are we trust in any or... I, Ron Paul. I, I, be, I believe that Ron Paul is a good man. I believe that he has morals and he has principles and he sticks to those principles. I do not believe that it is going far enough and I don't believe in representative government. No one represents me. I present me. No one is my representative. No one represents that which I am. I present that which I am through my consciousness, through my thoughts, my emotions, and my actions. So, I don't think uh, a representative government is the way out of this. I think that's a, uh, you know, we could, it could be a stopgap toward the higher level of truth and toward making a better world happen if we revert to the, some of the constitutional principles that were enshrined in our founding documents in this country, but it's not far enough by any stretch of, of the imagination. See, we need to employ the imagination to go much farther than that and to understand this concept of internal rulership, that there is no external rulership or authority. The, the authority that is talked about in the Constitution is also illusory and does not exist. So we have to go f far beyond the ideas that are even enshrined in the Constitution and go down to natural law principles, which I talk about over and over and over on this show, and understand what the actual natural laws of creation are and that there is no one between us and creation and the, the creator it's, itself, whatever you happen to believe that force is. That we are sovereign beings here. We have to recognize our sovereignty and then use our courage and our will to actually live that way. And it's not going to be an easy task. The force of fear is constantly pushing against that. And it, it, it wants us enslaved. We have to stand with courage against that force. And very, so this is actionless, very, right? This is a, no, more of an no. acceptance type of uh, methodology. Right? We're, we're not... It starts that way, because the take action without okay. knowledge is going to be folly. But then it, it converts sure. into action once you reach a certain level of awareness. This is enshrined in the three degrees of Freemasonry, the main three degrees, the, which are a reflection of the entire uh, journey of the Freemasonic journey. The first degree is the entrance of Christ, who, who comes because he has opened his heart. Okay? He, is, he has cared enough to better himself. The second degree is about the spellcraft, which is also about care, but is about starting to open up and gain more wisdom and knowledge, and not being able to see what's around the corner that's enshrined by the symbol of the uh, spiral staircase. But then the third degree Mason has enough knowledge where he now takes the trowel, which is a symbol of spreading cement, or spreading uh, uh, the, the, the idea that there is only one human family and that morals need to be cemented in place to bring that human family into oneness, into a state of oneness. And that is the third degree when you have mastered yourself. That's why it is called being entered in the first degree, being, being uh, passed in the second degree, and then being raised to a state of mastery in the third degree. Now, that doesn't mean that the people who want to know that initiation, those initiation ceremonies really understand that or are really truly raised, as I briefly alluded to. Uh, on past weeks of the show, but we will go deeply into that symbology and that um, um, that um, uh, occult symbolism uh, when we talk about Freemasonry and other occult schools of thought in on future shows. Well, I want to thank you for calling in and just great questions, really, really uh, thought provoking, and just keep keep going, 
keep staying the course, keep traveling, keep going forward toward the light, and um, it's not easy. I, I, I'll tell you, I struggle with it myself. By no means am I in any way perfect in any of this. Believe me. Okay? Thanks for thanks for that long explanation. I appreciate it. Absolutely. I'll keep you got it. You take care. Right. Now, uh, in no care, way, thanks. in no way, am I, am I, you know, I, I joke around with my friends and with, you know, my girlfriend and say, you know, God help us if I'm one of the better examples of what we have out there. <laughs> because that, that's, that's a bad news situation. If, you know, if, if I'm on the cutting edge of where we really need to be, you, you, it's a bad example overall of what we, the bar we want to really set. Because I fail in, in a lot of this, okay? But the, the point is, do your best, keep going forward. Don't, ex never accept where you're at. There's always another step to take, you know? It's a process. It's a process. All right, so that's great. And no problem. We got off the topic of food a little bit. Not a problem at all. That, there are no taboo topics here. You call in, talk about anything you want to talk about here. We've got another caller from Southeast Pennsylvania. You'll be the last caller for this evening. You're on What on Earth is Happening. What do you have for us? Hey, Mark. It's Eric Savannah here. Eric, how you doing, my friend? You know, I am so glad you have this radio show, man. You have, as, as, as much as my eyes were open, you have definitely opened my eyes, my mind, much further. And uh, I, I'm realizing more and more how, how just far down the rabbit hole we really are. I mean, it, it really does seem like most of society literally gone insane. I mean, I talk to people and they just, they're in a dreamland. I mean, they, they just don't really understand. There's, I wrote a list here because I know you're almost out of time. I wrote a list of like 10 different things right, that are just the problem here. I'll just run through the list really quick and you can just pick up on. Sure. Uh, let's see. Lack of true caring. Lack of first consciousness. Prozac. Astrophy. The monetary system. The mainstream media. Uh, like drama shows, uh, just overall insanity, there's a lack of historic, uh, historical references. People are making lame excuses for why their lives are the way they are, uh, instead of taking action. Uh, poor parents, there's really terrible parents out there that don't really teach their kids how to survive on their own or think for themselves. And the school system, the indoctrination system for the state, that sits there and brainwashes our children. And, uh, I mean, I, I could probably write a list of uh, maybe a few hundred things here that are the problem. I mean, there's no, there's no lack of uh, blame here. But there's a saying, it's, uh, you know, hope for the best, expect the worst. And uh, I think we should expect the worst because I, I see things getting much, much worse as, as we progress here. Things are going to get hairy. Uh, They're going to get tight. It's going to be, it's not going to be easy, okay? Um, but I think if we pull together and share what we know, and, and be examples. Don't put other people up on pedestals. That, that's, that's one of my main messages. You know, uh, We went to see David Icke. People come. They, they hear what he has to say. Don't put a guy like that up on a pedestal. He's speaking his truth. He's speaking the truth about what's going on. Be like him. Do what he's doing. You know, get out there, bring this information forward to as many people as will take any part of it and listen and change even a little bit. Well, that's all we have time for tonight, Eric. Thanks for calling in, man. Have a good night. Thank you, Mark. I appreciate it, brother. You got it. Talk soon. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to What on Earth is Happening.